You're listening to Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Joe Haberman, and today I'm here with three other people, namely Rebecca Kennison, Simone Saki, and Chris Long. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. So um, thanks very much indeed for joining me. Um, it's been a couple of weeks ago that um, you, um, together with a, bro a, a bigger group of people, um, published a, um, a white paper on open access in the open, like from an open science perspective and interrogated around community needs and perspectives. So this is basically um, today's topic. Would, um, would you, Simona, maybe start by sharing with us the scope of that white paper, the intentions and motivations behind, and yeah, how the group of contributors and authors came together. Well, I guess uh, uh, I'm Simone Saki. I am the Open Science Librarian at the European University Institute. And I think that, you know, just a little bit of history of how we came together first uh, uh, might make sense in order to provide some context for the white paper. Uh, the Humetrics HSS initiative uh, started in 2016, I think, uh, as an informal group of people that got together to sort of investigate ways to reshape a little bit assessment in uh, the humanities and social science. At least that was the initial goal uh, to sort of uh, try to understand how to uh, remediate a bit uh, the biases in the way uh, scholars in the humanities and social science were assessed, how their scholarly work was valued and so on. So we came together and uh, this became something <laughs> which we called the Humetrics HSS, which originally stands for uh, Humane Metrics in the Humanities and Social Sciences. And uh, after a few years of, you know, working together, uh, this white paper um, came about as the result of an intensive study, uh, qualitative study. Uh, and I think that, you know, maybe Maybe Rebecca and Chris can take up uh, uh, a little bit of the methodology of how we, we did it and uh, what is the uh, the main purpose and what what ended up being. Yeah, thank you also for for framing your positioning and maybe Chris and Rebecca or Rebecca first, um, if you share with us also where you currently work or what your um, what your affiliation is in context of that white paper and also. Um, with other projects that you've um, then related to this work. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm Rebecca Kennison. I'm the executive director of Can Consultants, which is a nonprofit consultancy that works uh, with higher education to try to transform everything. Uh, so, so a goal we all have in common. Uh, and I have the pleasure of uh, working with the other members of the Humetrics team on um, I'm really focusing on that and to um, Sima's introduction in terms of the methodology. Um, oh, I was part of the of the team along with uh, Chris and uh, Bonnie Thornton Dill and uh, and uh, Penny Weber and uh, and then the rest of the team to come up with a methodology that would really work for all of us. So. Um, uh, we interviewed 123 uh, members of the uh, Big Ten Academic Alliance, and maybe Chris will <laughs> explain a little bit about what that is, but it's a, a group of uh, research intensive universities in the United States. Um, and we talked to a variety of people, so um, deans and um, uh, faculty affairs uh, vice presidents and people who oversee um, research assessment, uh, librarians and, and any number of people um, to really try to understand the problems that they were encountering and the challenges that they were encountering, particularly in thinking about a values enacted academy. So that was what we were really um, uh, focused on. Um, and open access is, is part of that. Openness is, is one of the values that we, that we have that's a core value for our group, um, but along with um, several others. And again, maybe uh, I'll, I'll give Chris an opportunity to, to talk a bit about uh, the, that framework and methodology. Thank you. 
Yeah, Chris, also um, welcome to you as well, last but not so, certainly, but not least. Um, so what's your affiliation and, um, and also, yeah, what's the context with them? Well, thank you, Joe. It's really a pleasure to be with you and in conversation with my colleagues here in a public forum. I'm Chris Long. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters and the Dean of the Honors College at Michigan State University. And one of the things that we uh, have been intentional about since we started, as Simo said, in um, 2016 is trying to uh, live our values out in, in everything we do. And, and one of the things um, that we want to make sure we do is, is name the colleagues who have been part of this. And I know Rebecca has started doing a little bit of that. So I did want to name the, the, the teammates that we have here. When we started in, in 2016, Stacey Conkeel was a member of the team. And in, in the interim, she has sort of stepped into her own um, out, outside of working directly with Humetrics. Uh, but we have uh, Penny Weber, uh, Bonnie Russell, Bonnie Thornton Dill, um, Simo, Jason Rohde, um, Rebecca, myself, and, and Nikki Agate as well. So those are the, the sort of the team members. And one of the things you'll see at the beginning of our white paper is an attempt to uh, write each other into the, the paper as a, an intentional effort to think about what the meaning of authorship might be um, in a values enacted academy uh, when everything we do is, is um, co-authored to some degree, whether that be through uh, conceptualizing frameworks to thinking about the methodology, to reviewing work, to, ed to editing it, to copy editing it, you know, um, gathering the references, reviewing it. So, um, one of the things that we've been committed to in the project is to expand our understanding of scholarship from a very narrow set of uh, limited indicators that are often focused on individuals, uh, as if we acted in isolation from one another, and to extend, extend our vision of scholarship to recognize the embedded network of relationships in which we always uh, find ourselves and that really enhance and enrich the, the work. Um, one of the things that happened in that initial institution uh, conversation in the Triangle SCI uh, conversation was that we, we originally thought we were going to um, tr just transform, you know, indicators and metrics. We, we, we came up with this idea that we would reverse engineer things. Right now, you know, we uh, value what we measure, what we wanted to do was measure what we value. What we learned over the course of the, the years is that the conversation around identifying your values with your colleagues and then intentionally finding ways to put those values into practice through your scholarship, through your teaching, through your community engagement is the real challenge. And that has the capacity to transform the higher education endeavor by uh, aligning the things we say we ca care about with how we actually interact with one another. And that's really at the heart of what we discovered in this uh, white paper, which, which, which is that there is a great deal of desire for change in higher education. We encountered so many people who said, yeah, it's broken. We don't, we don't measure uh, scholarship in an effective way, but how to fix it is a different question. And that's sort of the, some of the recommendations we have in the white paper are, are all about that. And I think that, you know, related to what Chris just said, uh, we realized early on that there was no um, solution that would fit, fit or fix actually all the context and situations. So uh, instead of, you know, we, we started by crafting a set of values for the humanities and the social sciences. And we ended up, you know, sort of like making it something that was not worth uh, the effort at the end, because we realized that it, it was much more important to sort of like create a framework that would allow individuals and uh, groups of people uh, at the level of a college uh, institution or just a lab to really and clearly try to identify their own values uh, with respect to what they care about in terms of research or their scholarly life. So I think that the uh, sort of um, contextual uh, aspect of uh, um, you know 
working with the values is essential to our work. And this came up in the white paper as well. Sure. And one of the things that I think is really important about uh, what we're saying here as well is the intentionality at every level of, of the work that's being done. So um, we, we like to talk a, a bit about what we call microtransactions. Uh, Jason Rohde came up with this term, but uh, microtransactions, which are everything that we do together and within our daily life. And, um, and not just our scholarly life, although we focus on that, but just really um, having intentionality in bringing values to everything that we do and really interrogating what that looks like is, is crucial to um, what we're, the work that we're doing. Um, and again, that, that is uh, reflected in this piece, but also in, 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 in everything that we try to do um, collectively with each other and uh, outside and in these conversations and so on. So um, could we briefly talk about the groups of people that you also mentioned? So um, there's various, as we all know, various stakeholders in academia and scholarly um, knowledge dissemination. Um, from knowledge acquisition, being the researchers primarily, but also other stakeholders. So um, were you targeting a specific stakeholder group within the scholarly system or explicitly um, trying to balance and level across all stakeholders? And like, I'm asking that also with, with side towards um, where, the, where the response is differing um, from different stakeholder groups um, and then also in the light of the values that were expressed or um, addressed in the conversations or through the survey. Um, Chris, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, we have a great, um, one of the, one of the uh, awesome things about the white paper are the appendices and uh, a big shout out to Bonnie Russell who did a lot of work with some of the graphics around them. Um, uh, it, so we have a we have a, a appendix around that indicates all the different stakeholders, the different institutions, and the different groups that we had. Um, Mellon Foundation funded this research, and we agreed with them uh, that that we wanted to focus on one specific. Um, subgroup of um, of the US academic environment or higher education environment. So uh, given that uh, Bonnie Thornton Dill is the Dean of the um, College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Maryland, and I'm the Dean in, at Michigan State, it made some sense to focus on the Big Ten Academic Alliance, which is a group of 14 universities, uh, most of them public, but uh, Northwestern is, is a private institution. And, and we really tried um, to, to engage stakeholders from administration, uh, from the faculty, faculty shared governance, faculty senate, from librarians, um, and sort of to get a broad sense of the swath of the issue. We did focus on the promotion and tenure process. So that was also part of the agreement with the Mellon Foundation. Uh, what we found, of course, uh, is uh, a lot of really important um, uh, things to think about and learn about with respect to how um, faculty who are in tenure stream positions are privileged in certain ways and how so much of the work that our non-tenure system colleagues are doing uh, are remain invisible to the systems of evaluation and and mar and and our and, and that work is marginalized and really in ways that uh, undermine the integrity of what we're doing in, in higher education. So part of what we're learning in this process is, how can we um, think more holistically about the uh, endeavor that we're undertaking in higher education so that everyone, regardless of appointment type, uh, in terms of their, their um, status and their um, role in the institution can participate in, in, in the academic life in a robust and, and meaningful way. Thank you. Um... Simona, could you um, talk a little bit about the values that were highlighted through 
the white paper and also um, maybe values that you assume would be important for various stakeholders or the, or the target group as one. And were there any unanticipated um, or surprising responses and what was seen as a value? Well, I think that the, uh, so the perspective of the, of the white paper was actually to capture uh, so real life experience and expectations and issues uh, from um, you know um, these groups of people uh, from the Big Ten Academic Alliance universities and therefore uh, you know the uh, the way uh, the interviews were shaped and the way uh, the uh, outcome of the white paper in some ways shaped is actually uh, in a sort of a distillation of what came uh, from, from them uh, as, uh, of course, as a limited pool of uh, sample, let me use that, that term in, in between quotes. Uh, but I think that it was a, a, a well enough, um, uh, well, uh, with the numbers of interviews that were actually uh, concluded, a well enough sample to, un to understand what are the main and core issues um, that possibly needs to be tackled. And I think that, you know, the, the white paper, even in the, in the executive summary, there are some core recommendations that we uh, sort of like uh, um, prepared uh, as a sort of, a, you know, reflection upon the answer that we got and the values themselves, as you said, we, we are not really uh, concentrating now on defining values for others. Uh, it's more about making them in, in empower people. Uh, to reflect upon their own values. And I think that the recommendations from the white paper really uh, function uh, in this way. So they are suggestions, uh, argumented suggestions uh, to take up certain specific activities uh, with yourself, actually with your groups uh, within your um, organization or within your department. And um, that's how we actually operated there. But I think that, you know, maybe Rebecca can, can add something more there. Yeah, thank you. Also, I just wanted to add when I'm asking about the values, like it's so often re referenced, like, oh, we should go back to our values, but then, and then a few values are being mentioned, like transparency, um, uh, rigorous research, research integrity, and like, and now how, how can these values be served? And I think any human being and also scientists, uh, as we also human beings can um, can align with values, but why is it so, so important to remind ourselves um, of values that we like naturally comply with, Rebecca? Well, so one of the um, pieces of this work that is really important, and going back to the appendices that it ends up in the uh, appendix, is uh, we looked at the value statements that were presented by the Big Ten Academic Alliance universities within um, documents that they've put out, strategic plans or um, uh, other documents that outlined what they consider to be their own values and, and dug those out and then uh, put that in, in, a, in a grid form uh, to see that there were some, you know, so there are, a long list of values that uh, that universities uh, say that they care about. One of the things that we're we're interested in looking at is what the what the gap is between the values that um, that universities say that they care about and the actual work that's being being done at the university. So one of the one of the things that every single university that we talk to. Um, says that diversity is a, is a crucial, important value that they hold. Uh, what they mean by that and how it's uh, being expressed and uh, in, in what ways, you know, diversity of what and by whom. Um, uh, inclusion, as we know, is also a, is a problematic term because who gets to be included and by whom? <laughs> Uh, and who's in, you know, and, and so taking a look in, at those things and, and interrogating that. Um, and then, um, as, as you pointed out in, in your question, Joe, about um, um, how these values go across uh, disciplines and, and into, in, in, 
to individuals. I think uh, there's a, there's a lot of similarity. This is this is what we're actually hearing. Uh, back to what Simo was talking about as well. What we heard was actually much more uh, consistency across all the uh, 123 people that we talked to than we did inconsistency. Now that said, there were some people who were very keen on. Um, on using the traditional metrics that we have in place in order to understand uh, what's going on at their university and benchmarking against other universities and, and all this work that, that we know uh, happens um, throughout the academy and everywhere. I, I think everywhere in the academy is very much uh, focused on that kind of metrics uh, question. Um, but, what we also heard even within those interviews among people who were very uh, passionate about those benchmarks and, uh, and metrics and so on was an understanding that um, the individual was really important and the work that was being done at the individual level was really important and, and really how can you um, create success for people uh, was something that was at the heart of, of every of everything. Um, so I've wandered off a bit from, from, from how I started there, but going back to, um, yeah, I think there's um, the, the range of values. And, and again, this goes back to the intentionality. I think we all know there are kinds of values that we have in place, but then there are some things that we also like to point out. The values are not always positive. We think of values as very positive things, but um, people did did mention some values that might not be so positive, if I could put it that way, whether you think competition is a positive or a negative, for example. Um, uh, some competition um, got, got raised as a, as a value that some people have. So um, yeah. I don't know what to do with that, so. <laughs> I, I personally feel that some people might see competition as a source for um, success or well, in the academic context, rather innovation. That's competition is a necessity for innovation. And I personally don't believe in that, but maybe that's how they wanted to frame that positively. Let's um so the there is actually 108 values mentioned in appendix E. Um, thanks, for Chris, for pointing that out. Just to mention a few um, responsibility, openness, competitiveness, as we just said, practicality, cooperation, reliability, humility, open process, reciprocity, equality, caring, aspiration, which is randomly reading from the list, acceptance, empowering others, stewardship, attunement. It's a term I'm not familiar with. Non native English speaker, um, ethical imagination, holism. Yeah, and the list goes on. So just to give our listeners a, a little well, um, concept of what we are talking about, and you might have had some of these words in mind. Um, now, Chris, would you um, get to the point of why, why are we talking about this, about values in the light of changing uh, really changing the the system in a way because um, it was mentioned that the, or it's commonly accepted um, within academia that the, or there's there's a frequent narrative of a broken system. Um, so our values being compromised by the by the broken systems. Or how how is it that the values get compromised and how can we fix that? Quick fix, please. I, I appreciate that, <laughs> that question, Joe. It's a big one. Uh, but it, it really gets to the heart of the Humetrics Initiative. You, you mentioned, uh, Joe, a kind of um, conflict or at least one, one approach to ac academics and to uh, knowledge creation. It goes back to you know, ancient Greek thinking, at least, that it's a kind of an agonistic practice. You just bring ideas together, clash and combat and all this war metaphors, uh, very much of a, a competitive attitude. And then the truth will sort of come out of that. And I think what we're arguing for is that that, that approach to knowledge creation, to, to teaching and to the academic life is ultimately impoverished. It's ultimately rooted in a kind of metaphor that's destructive. 
And I think what we're uh, trying to open up is uh, a space for the intentional practice of values enactment. And what we mean by that is um, taking the time to think carefully about the things that you care most deeply about, and then finding ways with your colleagues to put the, the values that give meaning to your life into practice in the way you undertake your work as an academic. And what we're, what we're experiencing right now across higher education, and I don't think it's unique, it's not unique to the United States, I, I hear it in conversations with colleagues across the globe, the price many of people are paying for entrance into higher education and into the academy is a compromise of their values. We say I mean, the number one, uh, the number one value in the Big Ten Academic Alliance value statements that we found is diversity. And yet we heard over and over again from chief diversity officers in our interviews, from colleagues doing work that is um, engaged with indigenous communities or minoritized communities that they're having to do extra work. They're having to um, create spend energy to create the space where this work is recognized, where the contours of it are appreciated, and where the complexity and, and the time it takes to build the trust to do the work with integrity is not being captured by the system. So we say we care about diversity, but the structures pull us away from practices of diversity that would enrich our scholarship, enrich our teaching, enrich our lives together. So that's why we have a toxic culture in higher education. I think that's probably why we have a toxic culture more broadly, uh, an alienation from our own values. And the Humetrics Initiative, with many, many other colleagues across the globe who are really uh, working intentionally into this space, uh, are, are trying to undertake an intervention that is not to overlay another set of metrics, another set of indicators, but actually to do the hard work of identifying the values you, we care most deeply about. And then, and this is the critical part, intentionally putting them into practice together and holding ourselves accountable to the things we say we care most deeply about. It really is in those conversations about, okay, you say you care about transdisciplinary knowledge. Well, why does the system for promotion and tenure focus largely on disciplines and disciplinary ways of knowing? That's just not how it should function if you really mean what you say you care about. And another thing that we um, really heard a lot was about the importance of community engaged work. Um, and that this is a, a priority for universities everywhere, right? Um, but uh, the, the concept of, of uh, helicopter researchers is, is, is not unique to the global south. It happens everywhere in communities all, or, all around, uh, you know, communities just outside of the, of the universities that have always felt like they were, um, people would come in, do their research, and then leave them there, as opposed to building the community relationships that are needed to have truly community-engaged work. And that's... Uh, that again was a, was a theme that we heard across all of our interviews, the importance of community engaged work, and yet um, the time frame that people are given in order to do their work that doesn't allow for building those communities and really becoming engaged and really becoming part of those communities. And that there's a, a, there's a, a conflict between the again the values that the that the university and that the researchers themselves um, have to do that real deep community engagement to really um, have the community as their participants um, and this is a, a I've I've been um, at several symposia lately um, where people have been talking about trust in science um, and at core of of um, in, putting together uh, the trust in science is that community engaged um, aspect, but you have to be part, again, part of the community and this takes time. It takes years to become part of a community. And within the academy, we, we don't allow for that when what you're needing to do is uh, publish frequently, um, 
and and so on, uh, that there's not that time that can go in there. And so that's, again, uh, one of those really core things that is in conflict between what the university says that it wants, what the researchers actually really want, and then how the system works um, against, against that uh, by not allowing for that um, time and, and effort and the real human parts uh, of the research to, to come to the fore. Yeah, um, so now that we've um, outlined the difficulties and the challenges um, and, and also the scope, um, I would like to ask maybe again difficult questions <laughs> in the sense of were there any specific barriers that are the the that respondents to the interviews could point towards um, that can then be targeted and addressed in a solution oriented manner to dismantle those barriers and change them to an improved towards an improved system. Um, like we, we mentioned already the publication pressure, so away from matrices, but I mean, quality measurement needs to happen somehow. So where there are already ideas that were outlined and maybe in some institutions already, or departments at least, already in practice, that could solve the issue and be pragmatic resources for others to adopt. Um, Chris? Yeah, so a couple things. So we we have um, some a, a list of recommendations in the white paper that people can can look at. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that we um, practical I, just for a, a practical example, as you're asking for, there's a, a to follow up on Rebecca's example of community engaged work. Well, how how do you um, how do you know and and make legible the work that goes into that we have a recommendation that's based actually on um, a center that's happening at the university of minnesota where they uh a community engaged research center where they um, invite colleagues who are pulling their dossiers together if they have community engaged research they can submit their dossier to this to this committee and that committee will write a letter uh, about the community engaged work, almost a kind of peer review. It's it's external to the person's department, but it's but it's uh, written by people who have expertise in this kind of scholarship, so that that can be part of the 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 review dossier. So there's a kind of relatively simple structure to implement at the university level that would 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 um, give the the richness and the texture of community engaged research credibility and legibility to the, those evaluating the work. Um, so, so that's a kind of institutional piece. The other thing that I would say is, you know, and Humetrics initiative is really committed to rethinking the meaning of quality itself and connecting what we think of as quality with the intentional enactment of values. And so, um, you know, finding ways to make your values legible to those evaluating your work um, and then how you've put that into practice. Openness, a perfect example. You, Joe, you were bringing that up earlier in the conversation. If you care about openness, if that's a core value of, of yours, and in many institutions in the Big Ten, public research institutions, making ideas public is a core value, then you should be able to show how many of your publications, for example, have been published in open access formats. Uh, that would be one way of enacting that um, that commitment to openness. And so then, of course, you know, you you uh, begin to to nurture that community of open open access uh, research and and make the research more more public, and it has a kind of um, a cumulative effect. So there are there are sort of structural things that we can do. But then there are uh, very personal things. Just you know, if you care about uh, diversity, you know, who are you citing in your work? What work are you reading? Have you done a Have you done an audit of your own bibliographies in your own education? Uh, so it, 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 it's what's exciting is it, it can work on a very personal level, 
uh, and in certain things that can be done just, uh, just by deciding to do it. And then there are these bigger structural issues that we have to address um, that take a little more time. Yeah, Simona, also to this, and I'd like to ask you um, as the other, besides me, non-native English speaker in this round, um, how do you see language as a barrier in the current publishing system and or opportunities for multilingualism? But also, I, I really wanted to address um, or to um, add to what Chris just said. Please go ahead. No, no, sure, sure. Well, um, just a couple of uh, additions to what Chris just said, because I think that, you know, you mentioned the barriers at the very beginning of your question. And I think, you know, the metrification of the of academy is definitely one of the major barriers because of course uh, it seems that everybody re reports with somebody else and uh, there's an issue of skill uh, in uh, trying to figure out what what performance mean what what is going well and what it's not going well and especially when you think about you know uh, big institutions with you know thousands of people uh, in various roles working uh, towards the, the you know the major goal of the institution itself um, you know measuring something in a quantitative way uh, seems to be the only possible way to proceed uh, because it's it's the only way to scale at least in, you know in a, in a traditional mindset uh, but i think that the issue is even more uh, at, at the root of this is actually the idea that you know you don't have time to think differently and uh, and that's why we we put emphasis and actually that's the way we try also to run our own workshops and uh, i think that you know nikki nika gate and jason Roddy who run many of them uh, would uh, even add more to that that the, the general idea is just to let people have time to think uh, and reflect on what uh, Chris said, call me micro transactions it's all the thing and rebecca as well all the things that come to your everyday work as a scholar and uh, how those things that might feel as natural as possible to you, uh, but when you put intentionality in thinking about them, you can find a lot of bits and pieces or practical aspects that you can actually uh, sort of change slightly in order to embed one of your values in the way you work. Uh, the citation example, uh, it's a good one. It's also, you know, when you're creating a syllabus, for example, thinking about the values of diversity, thinking about the values of openness as well, just to pick the two that were mentioned before. So there are a lot of microtransactions there that um, that can really, you know, can be triggered, can trigger a change. Going back to the idea of language, uh, that's a, that's a, a big, <laughs> it would deserve an entire podcast on its own. Uh, it's a big barrier. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, English language is, uh, you know, worldwide recognized as the kind of uh, only uh, language uh, uh, to a certain extent that would feed, uh, you know, R1 institutions uh, kind of research. And the scholarly communication around uh, uh, different languages, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an enormous challenge uh, for everybody who is not working uh, either necessarily or because they are actually, you know, talking about um, aspects of life that are not easily translatable in English. Um, uh, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for them uh, because uh, if you think about the metritization of, of scholarly communication, it's also about you know, the selection of what counts uh, in terms of uh, scholarly communication venues and all of them are in English. Uh, there's no way around it, uh, at least for the time being. So it, it's a really big issue and I think it's uh, one that needs to be tackled. And I'm sure that, you know, if we if we look at, you know, uh, South American research, for example, uh, there's a big push uh, for the uh, Latin languages to be, uh, you know, become fully fledged language in, uh, in the scholarly communication. Even if we are not there, there's a big push uh, for that to happen. Yeah, I mean, multilingualism is also one of my favorite topics, and um, I'm investigating with, with several working groups on how we can facilitate multilingualism in, in research and scholar, scholarship as a whole. Um, and yes, it deserves its own episode for sure. <laughs> so I was welcome to, to join back for another one on that topic um, in particular. Um, so I would. Um, 
pointing okay so pointing out um again the the stakeholders funders publishers researchers and librarians i would i would like for each of us because it's four and it's four of us um to say one or two or three things each of these stakeholder groups should could provide to dismantle the barriers that we here talk about and so far you're free to pick so we have funders publishers researchers and librarians there's probably more um, but let's focus on these four um rebecca which one would you pick and what are the one or three recommendations you would have for them to to focus on um i would i would take publishers <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, since simo has to go in like uh one minute maybe he could go first and uh and take something other that's not publishers okay okay i think i can go first um so uh, i'll pick librarians uh because it's uh, sort of my <laughs> my personal perspective as well um uh, there are uh, well many recommendations i think that in general i think that for librarians is important to shape their work uh, in a way that would support those values, which doesn't mean only be, uh, you know, be supportive to researchers. It's also, it's also in their own activities as librarian uh, to work along the, the values that they care about. I'm thinking of openness for sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm open science librarian. <laughs> and I think that, you know, supporting research transparency in the best possible way. I think that there's a role for libraries to become trainers in a lot of aspects that are sometimes taken for granted by the research community but not make this explicitly therefore you might find the situations where uh, the lack of expertise in certain areas i'm thinking of uh, as i said uh, you know all the as practical aspects of research transparency going from open science practice in the workflow research data management uh, to um, anything that is you know uh, study pre-registration in the social sciences, anything that would elevate research in terms of uh, being open and transparent is something that might feel, uh, might become very natural for librarians to take up. So that's kind of my, uh, my own perspective and advice. Thank you. And Rebecca, the publishers? So um, publishers have a huge role to play uh, in terms of everything that um you know and the, and the the traditional output on which metrics are based are our publishing outputs whether that's books or articles or or so on um but i was involved in a, in a project a, a couple of years ago looking at publication ethics um in philosophy in particular but uh generally recognizable across the board where we identified that the most important thing that publishers could do is to reinforce the the standards of 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 the values that they again need so uh, so publishers can really um focus people's efforts on uh, being intentional about the values that they're bringing to bear to their work so just using citation practice as a as a as an example uh, most publishers do not actually ask the question or have reviewers ask the question why have you as the author cited the people that you've cited why have you not cited certain people what is your process that you went through in your citation practice? And if they would just ask that question, they would have a very different kind of uh, response and answer, I think, mm -hmm. um, to really think about the diversity within, within the, their citation practice. Um, that's a simple thing that, that publishers could easily do, but nobody does that. Hardly anybody does that. The number one thing that we did see that people uh, did in, uh, the publishers offered was about how to use their open access fund. Uh, but that's their own personal uh, professional um, aspect to try to clarify um, and segue into funders here probably, but try, try to clarify uh, 
um, if you're being funded, how you would then uh, proceed in an open access world. But that's quite different from openness a, as a value there. Um, so there are numerous things that publishers could do to really help um, authors and reviewers and editors um, think about values within the system that right now is just completely lacking. So that would be uh, what I would like to see. Thank you. And now we still have researchers and funders on the list, Chris. All right, I, I will, I, I'll take a look at funders, but I actually wanna say a, a broad uh, point about all of these, mm -hmm. because the points that we were making earlier really apply to every category that you've uh, emphasized here, Joe, which is review the values you care most deeply about and imagine what the world would look like if you put those values into intentional practice in every decision you make, every policy you adopt, every structure you develop, every aspect of every process that you're involved in, every engagement that you have with your colleagues. So thinking about that with regard to, um, so let's say funders means um, considering the, the, the kind of, the, you know, the mission of your organization as a funding organization and how you're actually um, putting those values into practice, not, in, not just in terms of what you fund, but how you go about making decisions about what you fund. So for example, if you have, if, you're, if you really think and believe, which I do, that these grand challenges that we're facing are only going to be addressed with multidisciplinary uh, approaches that bring things that, that bring the humanities and the sciences and the social sciences and the arts together in a meaningful way, you need to have processes uh, that allow all of those voices to be part of um, the projects and that are uh, that when you review the project, the voices from with expertise in those areas are are at the table and can bring their uh, conceptions to, to bear. We have a lot of work to do around with respect to particularly, I think, funding in the sciences where um, the, the, the money is wagging the dog of the, the research. We're, we're, we're researching certain areas that we think will uh, be profitable in, in the end and not necessarily the, the, the research that will impact the broadest uh, swath of the global community or in, 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 dig, or in, in specific kinds of uh, specific communities that where certain research is really needed to address health issues that are there, for example, that, um, you know, there's not going to be a huge uh, amount of profit potentially made, but it's very important for these certain communities that this research be done. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I think it's, again, it's the same strategy. Put your values into intentional practice in everything you do and hold yourself accountable to the things that you think um, are, are giving life and meaning to your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which brings me to also addressing researchers. When in my courses, when I ask um, research, like for the most part, early career researchers, why are we talking about science communication? Why are we talking here in this workshop about scient um, scientific writing? Then upsettingly to me, some of the people in the course re reply, well, I have to publish to graduate. That's why I'm here. I'm like, okay. And that's what, like, okay, but why? Are you a researcher in the first place? And how do you think what you accumulate as knowledge will ever find its way to other stakeholders of society or the general public or anyone to read really? Like, this is what I want to convey in my courses. So I'd like for researchers to get to reconnect with the why they made a decision to become a scientist in the first place. Um, and that I think will naturally bring to life again the values that we all comply with. And yeah, and then in connection to what you all of you just said, bring the stakeholders together, reminding them also of humanly intrinsic value systems to create knowledge, to disseminate knowledge, to, to create a better world, well, that unfortunately um, our generations um, messed up 
pretty much. And I, I, I also believe, like you said, we have grand challenges and researchers have a big role to play in solving these and we still can, for sure. Nature is a, um, yeah, I mean, nature, the ecosystem <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a fascinating system in itself and has, a, has much, what's the word? Um, has, has a great survival mode. <laughs> the question is how much sacrifice are we willing to, to convey along the way? And I think we can limit that with the help of research across disciplines. Okay, um, maybe any, I mean, that could be, well, mine, like everybody's statements now could already be the concluding remarks, but is there anything else you would like to get off your chest, Rebecca, Chris? Rebecca? Uh, well, I was going to uh, say a word or two, Joe, about what you just said about nature and the, eco the ecosystem of nature, because I, I've been thinking a lot about um, the nature of scholarship and the nature of the, how we practice scholarship. It is so ensconced in a certain kind of um, conception of uh, liberal subjectivity, certainly in the United States and I think in, in the Western Hemisphere. And that conception of subjectivity with its sort of emphasis on the atomic individual that's, that's autonomous and independent and somehow separated from the rest of nature um, is causing us to engage in scholarly practices that are impoverished uh, because we're not taking um, uh, we're not we're not taking advantage of and really living into the network of connections that we um, that shape who we are as 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 thinking beings and so what we really need is a scholarly ecosystem that does some more justice to the nature natural ecosystem in which we that that we inhabit and that sustains us as so sustains human life it sustains natural life and if we don't find ways to recognize how we are co-authoring the work for example together how we are um, shaped by the environments that give us life and how the responses that we make, whether it be through our research, not just being extractive, but actually being reciprocal and engaged and based on trust and based on um, real learning. If we, don't, if we don't learn how to do that very quickly, and if we don't teach our institutions how to recognize uh, that much more complex and richer way of doing scholarship with one another and with the natural world, we will uh, continue to erode um, our relationships with each other and with the world that sustains us. Thank you, Rebecca. Any concluding remark to add on that? I, I couldn't say it more eloquently than Chris, Chris did, so I'm just going to leave it there. I think that was, that was uh, really a, a beautiful contemplation as well as they enter into Monday, Monday morning here thinking about um, how to interact uh, with all kinds of <laughs> all kinds of ecosystems, uh, but it has been really great having this uh, connection conversation this morning. I'm I'm feeling very energized myself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, beautiful wrap up indeed. And as a biologist, I can totally relate. Nature really plays a perfect template or provides a perfect template for any system as humans can create and reshape and, and dismantle and, and reconstruct in a better way. So let's, let's get to work for, with your pointed um, recommendations in the white paper. And I'm mentioning the title again. The, the white paper is also available in the show notes and um, in the associated blog post. So we're, it's open access in the open, community needs and perspectives. And yeah. And I'm looking forward to continuation of this work in whichever constellation and to hear from all of you. Um, yeah, anytime soon. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.